I'm back. Hey there, I'm Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com, and I have taken a couple of week hiatus from Goulet Q&A. This is episode number 59, and it is December 12th of 2014. And uh, things have been a little bit crazy lately. I was originally not planning to take off this much time. I was gonna try to get one done during the week of Thanksgiving. Didn't happen, take time with my family and stuff like that. That was good, so I kinda like didn't plan for that. I was gonna aggressively try to get one out for that Q&A. Didn't, so I'm sorry, I kind of bailed on you there. And then last week, I literally like lost my voice. I had a sore throat and all that stuff. You can listen. I did a Pen Addict podcast. I shot a couple of videos last week and my voice was sounding real froggy. I'm actually still got a little residual thing going on. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely much better this week. We've had sickness rolling through my whole family. It's been just crazy. So anyway, I'm back. I have three weeks of Q&As to catch up this week, and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna try. I've gone through um, and pulled as many questions as I possibly could. I got like 25 questions queued up for this week, so I'm gonna try to blow through and make it happen. So, um, let's see here, I'm gonna try to set a record. I don't know if 25 would actually be a record, but that's what I'm shooting for. So, I prepared as much as I could for this one, but you're gonna be getting a lot of improvisational feedback from me on this Q&A. Back on the very like first couple, I didn't plan anything, I just picked questions and kinda of went with it. And then I went to more of like a, let me think through ahead of time and name you all these specific like product names and stuff like that. So, we'll see how this one goes. So this is gonna be a little bit kind of a different uh, routine. It's the holiday season, things are crazy around here. And I'm feeling a little bit, um, you know, not antsy is probably not the right word, but feeling a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. like, I, I don't know what word you describe that. So a little bit punchy, I guess. So I don't know. I'm going to try and just like bing, 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 go through all these questions. So first question I have is Andrew D in an email said, in your video of 12-1-2014, the Omas Ojiva Alba Nibs, uh, you had a black case on your desk near your right elbow. It looks like a flute case or a pen case. I figure if it was in your video, it must be a pen case. Anyway, if it's a pen case, what type of brand is it and where can I get one like it? It is not a pen case. That was my clarinet case. That case is probably 50 to 70 years old. I don't know. I don't have the exact date. I don't have a brand on it either, but it's an ebony clarinet. It's really nice, actually. I started playing clarinet when I was in sixth grade. Switched to bass clarinet and then contrabass clarinet, which I played in high, all throughout high school. Um, so that's my personal clarinet that I have. And why would I have that at the office here? Well, you'll find that out soon enough. <laughs> okay, Vincent T on Facebook. Do you think that gold nibs are more prone to breaking in and getting thicker than their steel counterparts? I've heard rumors since gold is a more malleable material. Um, that's, that's true. Gold is definitely softer than steel. Um, as far as breaking in goes, you know, um, personally, I've talked about this in previous Q&As, I think the break-in, like the initial break-in period of like a couple of weeks, I honestly feel that's mostly people just getting used to using a new pen. You know, every pen is different. You know, the feed and the, the way it flows and the way the nib writes and the way it's ground and stuff, that all matters. And even the, the, the direction you hold it, the rotation, the speed, the writing speed, all that stuff can be affected. That's why there's so many different opinions out there about these different pens, because everybody's writing style is very different. There's a lot of variables going on. So honestly, I'm of, the, I'm of the mentality that most of the break-in period, initially the first couple of weeks anyway, is you breaking yourself in to the pen. Um, now what I have seen, and I know you know you refer referring to some of the things I've talked about in the past, like my Custom 74, how it's gotten broader over time, it's broken in. That's because I've written with it with a heavy hand and I, it, I, I have naturally gotten it to write more to how I want it to write. That definitely happens faster with a gold nib as opposed to a steel. Gold is a softer material. You know, the tines are more, more springy, more flexible, if you will. Not flexible in terms of line variation necessarily, but um, flexible in terms of the material bends more than steel. So yes, it will break in faster than steel, but it's still gonna take a little while, okay? Hopefully that helps. All right, at Stephanie PVNE87 on Twitter, is there a cutoff date for guaranteed Christmas delivery from Goulet Pens? Um, so a little bit of a time sensitive question here. I'm glad you asked it for this week. So yeah, guaranteed, no, like we can't guarantee. Even USPS Express Mail now isn't guaranteed overnight or anything. So I would give yourself a little bit of a buffer. So what I'm saying is like, you know, if you're, if you're international right now, you already missed the window for any type of, you know, even than anything close to a guarantee because just the holidays are very busy. You know, one thing I will say is that right now we're noticing, this is kind of a seasonal thing, but we're noticing right now especially, a lot of tracking isn't up, getting updated in process as it's moving. You know, I guess USPS, maybe, uh, you know, probably not FedEx and, and 
you know, UPS, but I have no idea. I don't use them for outgoing services. Um, but USPS, they are not scanning things as diligently in process as they're going along. So we're getting a lot more emails and stuff about, hey, my, you know, my package hasn't updated in two days. Well, <coughs> it's still moving along. It's just not getting scanned along the way. Sorry, I mentioned I still got a throat thing. Let me cough. <coughs> Sorry, all you podcast listeners. <laughs> I drink a little water. That's going to slow me down if I keep coughing. But anyway, so with that in mind, give yourself a little bit of time. If you're in the U.S., it's going to depend on where you are within the U.S. You know, we're in Virginia. If you're on the West Coast, it's going to be longer. But I would say by Wednesday the 17th would be a really good time. It's hard with Christmas being in the middle of the week. You know, because uh, you got the weekend and everything to factor in there. So I would say the 17th would be really good. And the reason I say the 17th is because that gives us time to process everything. We usually get a rush right before kind of the cutoff date, if you will. So that'll give us time. If it takes us, you know, a day or so to actually pack and ship up your order, it would actually go out on the 18th, which would be a Thursday, give you a couple days over the weekend, say a day or two of delay. That would be kind of the guarantee that I would, that I would buffer in there. Yeah, you could definitely probably order something on the 19th and still get it in time, especially if you're close by. But the 17th is what I would suggest you make as your kind of order placement date. <coughs> Excuse me, goodness. All right, next question I have is actually from somebody on my customer care team, Margaret. And she said, many people have asked for suggestions for the best starter pens for beginners, Platinum Preppy, Pilot Metropolitan, Lamy Safari, etc." For those of us who took your advice and enjoyed those pens, what are good options for the next step up under $100? I'm not sure I want to spend the money on a gold nib pen at this point, because most of those, <coughs> pretty much all those, are above $100. But I'm definitely ready to see what I could get in the next price point beyond my starting pens. Great question, Margaret. I've been asked about this um, you know, time and time again. Uh, I probably need to do a video on it at some point, maybe like a Fountain Pen 101 video on not your starter pen, but like your next pen, second pen. I know Stephen Brown's done a video like that in the past. Um, can't recall exactly which one, but look it up. So I got a bunch of different pens. I'm just going to kind of blow through them, so bear with me. I'm going to write them down in the blog post so you can go back and reference them. But the Lamy Studio is a great one, especially if you have a Safari. You can use the same nib on the Studio. You could get a different nib on the Studio, swap them out between the two. That'd be cool. Twisby's got a lot of good ones. <coughs> Excuse me. Dang it, I'm going to be coughing this whole time. Okay, sorry. Twisby 580 and the Twisby VAC 700 would both be good options, $50, $65 range there. Conklin Duragraph, that pen is a pretty darn good value. We're freaking out of like most of them right now. But it is a really good pen. Part of it is it's such a great value. Part of it is we had a little bit of an issue with some of the pens not posting properly. So we had to send back like half our pens. We had to go through our whole stock when we did not have time to do that and then send back everything that wasn't posting properly. So if you're getting anything from us, it will post properly because we're going through and checking every single one, but there was a little manufacturing issue with some of them not posting quite all the way, but they were supposed to. So um, still a good pen though, aside from that posting issue, that's the only thing. <coughs> Delta Unica is also a really good one. That one's more in the $76 range, but that's a really nice pen. Um, the Faber-Castell Loom or the Basic, I'm a big fan of both of those. The uh, Acrylic or Ebonite Noodler's Conrad, they are, you know, they did just come out with an acrylic uh, Neponset, which would be really cool, except you can't find them anywhere. The Platinum Balance or the Platinum Cool, that would also be a good pen. The Monteverde Intima, I like that pen. There's a lot of Monteverde pens kind of in that range, so you can just check out all the Monteverdes, but the Intima specifically, I like that pen. And the Schaefer 100 or 300, you know, those are pushing $60, $80, kind of upper in the limit where the studio is. But, you know, Schaefer especially, um, you know, has got a pretty solid reputation. A lot of people like those pens. So those would be some of my recommendations there. There's certainly a lot of other options. But those are some of the ones I like. Man, I'm like dying here. I'm really sorry. I thought I was going to be able to talk to you really fast through this whole thing, but we'll just have to kind of see how it goes. Tracy P. on Facebook. Should I let my pen completely dry out after washing before I reassemble it? Should I worry about mold developing if I don't? <coughs> well, um, no, I, I've n almost never heard of that actually happening. You know, mold growing in a pen like that is not even something I've really heard about. I guess potentially there is, it's a possibility, but I don't think the water would stick around long enough to actually grow anything. You know, if you have any water left in your pen, it's going to evaporate out of that pen eventually. So I don't think it's going to be an issue. 
Um, but especially, you know, I would say the only time you may want to consider doing any kind of disassembly, you know, letting it dry out, because if you know you're not going to use that pen for a long time and you want to actually store it, okay, maybe you want to do that depending on how practical that is for you. But, you know, especially if you're going to be inking it back up again soon, you don't need to sweat it. Just, you know, clean it out as best you can. What I usually like to do is I clean it out, you know, and then um, I'll take a paper towel and just touch it to the nib and try and soak everything out of the feed. Make sure that uh, that's dry. It takes about 10 seconds to do that. That's about all you really need to do. <coughs> sorry. Oh, okay. Everybody on the podcast, I'm just really sorry. I guess <laughs> here I just talked about how I'm better and I'm like falling apart and dying as I'm shooting this thing. Anyway, uh, Annalise A on Facebook, do you know of any holiday card company that uses good enough paper for a fountain pen? Ah, shoot. I don't know why I put this question in there because no, I don't. <laughs> I usually try not to put questions in here where I'm like, nope, I have no clue what to do for you. But, you know, I guess I've been asked about this several times, so I kind of wanted to address it here. I don't know of any company specifically that has, like, fountain pen friendly holiday cards. You know, they're kind of random, you know, especially even within one brand, you know, depending on the type of card that it is, they use different, all different kinds of stuff. So there's really not, they really are not going for consistency and stuff in that way when making greeting cards. So I'm sorry, but I don't have anything there to help you out. Caitlin P on Facebook, in the world of vintage pens and modern pens, both fountain and dip, how can you tell if nibs can be interchanged without damage to the pen, nib, or feed? Receive many nibs, both fountain pen and dip, and want to know if I can tell if I use them in a modern pen. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and for having the best customer service around. Oh, well, thank you, Caitlin. Um, <coughs> excuse me. That, this is uh, definitely one of those areas where you are kind of on your own. You know, you got to do some research and do some experimentation and stuff like that. Especially if you're getting into vintage, you know, good luck. There's not a lot of standardization across brands, especially for that kind of stuff. And when you get into nibs by themselves, you know, sometimes manufacturers stamp the name and stuff. A lot of times they don't. So who the heck knows what you're dealing with? You know, they definitely don't stamp the the overall size, they might have the tip size stamped on the nib, but they're not going to have like whether it's a number six or number five or anything like that. So you're just going to have to investigate, try, experiment, and try to figure that stuff out. That's really about the best one. What I can say is that usually you're not crossing over between dip and fountain pen. Those are two completely different things. You might see a hack every now and then where somebody takes a dip pen and puts it on a fountain pen. Sorry, takes a dip nib, puts it on a fountain pen, but that usually doesn't work out great, you know, especially not consistently. So um, that's what I would say. You know, pretty much you need to stick with a manufacturer. If they offer a replacement nib, that helps. But other than that, you're looking at somebody like me or somebody else who shoots a video or does a blog post or puts on a forum or somewhere that has experimented and done that hack and figured that out. And then it's kind of just known that that's a workaround. But that gets harder the further back you go into vintage stuff. So you're in for some experimentation. <coughs> Myra R on Facebook, what inks would you recommend giving someone you bought a fountain pen for that could enhance their writing experience? Gosh, well, I sell about 560 inks at the moment, so really any of those could work. Um, <laughs> the ones I recommend giving, okay, so it depends on what your budget is. You know, Noodlers has a lot of different inks, but their uh, properties can range quite a bit, so some people can get frustrated if they get something like a Bay State Blue that, or a Kung De Chang that's harder to clean out and they're not quite ready for it, or if they have something like a Rome Burning or a Blue Nose Bear that has like some weird kind of different properties to it that maybe is not, in, maybe feathers a little bit more, or it's a quick drying and they don't need that, you know, so. There's a lot of different things, but that might, you know, stick to kind of more the conventional color range, the kind of the standard color line within Noodlers would be good, you know. Um, but uh, it's usually not a terrible idea to give somebody, if you, you know, if they have a pen or something like that, giving them the ink that's made by the pen company, it's usually kind of a more, you know, most of those colors tend to be a little more, you know, I'll call them boring. They're just a little more standard kind of color ranges. Uh, the boutique inks like Diamine, you know, Noodlers, Pride Reserved, Air Bond, those tend to have some more interesting kind of colors because they're ink companies that focus on that more. The pen co companies kind of go with just more, ah, kind of just, you know, well-rounded color palette. Usually nothing too extreme in there. So, you know, that's kind of the safer route to go with a manufacturer's ink. 
but uh, giving it as a gift, it's usually not a bad idea to do that. Um, and then, you know, something like Pilot Orochizuku or Faber Castell, those are kind of premium inks that look really nice, end up looking really good as a gift. You know, ink colors are fairly um, nice. Uh, bottles are really nice, good presentation. So that would probably be um, what I would say kind of on the upper range. But um, yeah, or just get them a bunch of ink samples too. That could just let them play around with it. That's that's part of the fun for me, honestly, is just getting to experiment. So, you know, you just have to gauge that based on the person you're giving it to, right? All right, Eric O on Facebook. What is the maintenance for a Twisby 580 like? I have gin howls and lamis, and I like the ease of cleaning. I'm not a collector and consider pens as tools. For me, the real action is on the ink side. Yeah, man, I'm with you. So uh, if you're changing inks out all the time, the 580 is going to be a little bit more frustrating pen than a Jin Hauer or a Lamy. You know, personally, I like to stick my piston filling pens with a more consistent ink rotation. You know, I'll change the ink colors out and stuff like that, but I usually kind of stick to a similar color or I just take one color and kind of stick with it. When you've got a large body of ink like that, you know, changing colors out all the time, you know, first off, to something like a Twisby 580, you got like 1.4, 1.3, whatever milliliters in there. It kind of takes you a while to go through that. You got to be using it pretty heavily at that point. You know, so if you're changing colors and just experimenting, using all kinds of different stuff, something with that great of an ink capacity might actually be a worse pen to use if you are wanting to change colors all the time because the main advantage of a pen like that is it's got a big cavity of ink so that you don't have to change the color and don't have to fill the pen all that often. So it's kind of like, you know, not necessarily the, the, my ideal use for that pen. Um, I tend to stick with one color with, or, or a certain range of colors, you know, blue is always a good one, um, for pens like that that have a larger ink capacity. The Gin House, the Lamy, stuff like that, you can flush those things out with the blue bulb syringe. Um, that's where it's really helpful. Oh yeah, I forgot my little guy here. Um, that's where it's really helpful um, to use those. So that's what I end up doing. I use things like the Safaris and um, Pilot Metropolitan and other cartridge converter pens for when I want to just experiment and use different inks, you know, and kind of churn and burn them. Usually I'll only fill like half a converter or maybe even just fill the feed and not even get too much into the converter when I'm trying a new ink and I just want to blow through because I know after I get through a page of writing, I'm going to want to try a different ink. So that's where I'll stick to those pens. That gets kind of frustrating on a piston filling pen. You know, the Twisby 580, the, the maintenance is actually better on that pen than a lot of others because you can disassemble it, you can get in there, Q-tip the thing out if you want to. But it's definitely, you know, it's a clear pen so you see every single thing in there and it's a piston filling pen so it's a big ink capacity. So it is one of the more frustrating pens if you're changing ink colors all the time. So that's really not the best use but you can certainly do whatever the heck you want, man. Uh, Ty W on Facebook, how do we fountain pen lovers manage a panic attacks when there's two weeks of no Q&A? <laughs> that's funny. Uh, better asked, how do newbies order the step after that legitimately help get others hooked? Well, that's interesting. Um, you know, honestly, for me, I just let my passion sell it, right? So I am not trying to convert the world over to fountain pens because, you know, they're finicky sometimes. They take some work. You know, believe me, I've talked to every single one of my family members and all that kind of stuff. I've shown them what I what I do and what the pens are like, but. You know, my mother-in-law has a couple fountain pens. She doesn't use them that often because you got to clean them, you got to maintain them, they dry out. She, you know, she doesn't necessarily want to keep up with that as diligently, say, as I would. You know, who I'm just doing that all the time. It's a part of my life. Um, so I don't force it. You know what I mean? So I'm not trying to like push it on everybody. You know, you can believe that my family members pretty much get fountain pen stuff for Christmas almost every year. Um, you know, if they're into it. Um, but you know, I, you know, my parents have them, my sister-in-law, you know, just everybody's got fountain pens and some will use them more than others and that's okay. So for me, it's the passion, just the sharing, the camaraderie, the, hey, let me introduce you to this thing to you. Use my pen, check it out, borrow this, you know, that kind of thing. Let them try it out. And then gauge if they really like it. If they're like, oh, this is really cool. And they're still like, oh man, they had this thing, but it wasn't really like that. Well, okay, well, why don't you try cleaning out? Let me show you this tip. And if they're really engaged in that, great. Like show them and, and, and show that. But if they're like, ah, you know, they're like, well, I lose my pens all the time. Or, you know, that's the biggest excuse I ever get. Well, I lose my pens, so I don't buy any nice pens, which nice is anything over like $2, right? 
well, I don't, you know, or, or, well, it dries out. And you're like, well, that's because you left the cap off of it for three hours. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to dry out. You have to, you know, be aware of these things. And if they're just like, well, it's just, it's too much hassle. And I'm like, all right, this is not for you. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to try to sell you on this whole new lifestyle if it's something that you're not really going to want to do. So that's where I would say, use your passion, share your experience with that person, engage with them if they engage back with you. But don't try to hard sell it because then you're just going to turn people off. You're going to seem like that weirdo who's always trying to push your hobby onto them and it's going to be a weird thing. So don't, that's, that's something that I would steer away from, but you know, you do whatever you want. Julia L on Facebook, non-fountain pen related, but what advice would you give about working with a firm to redesign an organization's website? Oh boy. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's a good question. You know, we recently redid our website here. We worked with another company, Mozu, to be able to do that. Um, it's been a little, uh, you know, it's in the grand scheme of things, yes, we have an operational website. There's a lot of wins. There's a lot of things we've had. We've definitely had some bugs. We've had some quirks. We're working through some things. Um, you know, there's little things that break here and there, and that's been hard. You know, the biggest piece of advice that I would have over all of it is plan the heck out of it. and. Don't launch an e-commerce website in the middle of your holiday season. That's definitely been <laughs> something that I, uh, you know, probably would uh, think twice about doing again. Um, you know, I knew going into it, you know, Rachel and I talked a lot about it and we knew this was like the, the worst time to do it. Um, historically though, we have stayed pretty busy. You know, we've kind of done a stair step thing with Goulet Pens. That's why we keep growing. We get busy in the holidays and then after the holidays, it's kind of a new plateau and we just kind of keep going from there. So in our mind, it was like, well, we're really not going to be less busy in January or February than we are right now. And that's kind of been the pattern. Of course, we never really know. It's a guess. Um, however, the franticness, the chaos of the holiday season just because of the time sensitivity and um, the amount of new people that are coming in who've never seen your site before. Um, that's probably something we underestimated a little bit for this holiday season. So that's been a little stressful, you know, having somebody that you, you know, having a partner that you can work with and communicate issues to and having them be really responsive. You know, I would say the best thing that you can do is, is start the communication early. And however the communication is like early, if, it's, if you're having some issues early on, you're going to have a lot more issues when this stuff really hits the fan. When start, stuff starts moving to production site or once you actually launch. You know, we had all these things that worked perfectly and then we launched the site and all this random stuff started breaking. And that's, we've been trying to fix all that stuff. And I know there's just like all these little issues that, are, that you're experiencing or that people are talking about in all these different places. You know, some of that stuff is like, oh, we fixed this thing. Oh, wait, this little thing broke over here. We got to figure out what's going on over there. And it's like whack-a-mole almost some, with some of these issues. It's just a huge project. It's just a huge thing. Everybody that I talk to that's in the industry is like, yeah, this is kind of just how it goes. You know, every single web launch like this is painful. It always takes time to fix these things. It's always more complicated than you think. There's always random browser issues that you run into. And that's just kind of how it is. So I would say the biggest advice I would have is make sure that you're personal like company situation is in a good place to make that transition. That has been um, one of the more challenging things that we've had has just been the timing of it all, which it was an, a year and a half long project. So it wasn't like we could precision time when it was going to launch. Originally it was supposed to be June. Now here we are. We launched in November. Not ideal, but here we are. We're working through it. There's no going back. Carry on. Travis W on Facebook. Also, I have a collection of tiny pens growing. I own the Twisby Mini, Quaco Sport, and Quaco Lilliput, which you don't carry. I had to buy elsewhere. Forgive me. <laughs> don't apologize. If I don't carry it, I don't hold anything against you. Well, I don't anyway, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, the Lilliput's one of those things. It's a special order thing, and I can't get it very easily. Um, aside from the Paquito, are there any other tiny fountain pens you know of that are worth buying? Oh, gosh. Yeah, Paquito is definitely a tiny one. The Twisby Mini is, is small, but it's not tiny. Um, Quaco Sport, Quaco Lilliput. Okay, so these are all steel nib pens. Um, the, I think the Lilliput steel nib, I'm not 100% sure on that actually, uh, but I believe it is. So the other one that I can think of that is fairly small is the Pilot E95S, also known as the Pilot Elite in some places. Um, so that one is definitely small, very short, um, especially if it's uncapped. When you cap it, it becomes a little bit longer, so that's kind of cool. That's the only one that's like coming to mind. The Paquito is smaller, that thing is a tiny little guy. Um, the Jerbon Rollerball is pretty small, but I uh, wouldn't, you, you know, you're talking about fountain pens, and so I wouldn't do that. Um, those are the ones that come to mind. Yeah. 
Edgar H. on Facebook, if you were a great, great classical composer and you were writing a symphony, what pen and ink would you use? Good question. Um, well, you know, there's several manufacturers of music pens now. Uh, Pilot just came out with a music pen in, well, we just got it in the U.S., a music pen uh, on their, it's a three-time music pen on their custom 912. That's one option. Um, Platinum, excuse me, Platinum 3776 has a music pen. That one I really like. Noodler's Neponset is a music pen as well, a flex music pen. Um, Franklin Kristoff, I don't do anything with them, but I know they have a music nib that you can get as well. I've heard some pretty decent things about that. I'm um, hoping not leaving it. Sailor has a music pen, but it's just a stub basically, so that's really not the thing um, that I would consider. So, you know, those are the ones, I would say probably the platinum one, honestly. Um, of all the music pens that I've used, that one writes the smoothest straight up and down, which if I was a classical composer, I'd probably be at a piano, which is why they do that. So when you're writing with a music nib pen, kind of the point, it's a stub nib pen that's ground so that when you're writing at a steep angle like this, it's going to write more smoothly. And then it's italic so that it, you know, stub so that it can, um, you know, write your quarter notes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. All those music -y, music -y notes. Um, so the, the platinum one has been kind of the, the smoothest, best one in my experience there. It stays very wet um, there. So, and now it's available on a couple of different of their colors of the 3776. It used to just be the black one. So that's kind of cool. So that would be my choice. Uh, and then the ink, uh, I don't know, whatever. It, that is not really as critical. Probably something permanent, I would imagine, because you would hate to compose something and then spill a drink on it. So something like Noodler's Black, Platinum Carbon Black. You probably want something black. Heart of Darkness, you know, something like that. Stacy W on Facebook, I would love to know Rachel's favorite pens. I know she likes 1.1 italics, but which specific pens are her favorite? Um, she's got uh, several. Um, she has a lot of Edison Nouveau premieres. You know, it's an exclusive pen that we have. The reason she has so many of those is because um, whenever we're looking to do a new color, or especially with these seasonal ones now, we'll usually have Brian Gray make up a couple of different ones if we have a hard time deciding between materials. And then we are just, you know, basically buying ourselves whatever pen is uh, the dud, the one that we don't choose. Um, and we can't sell it, so we just kind of keep it. So Rachel, ends, Rachel has all these like, kind of one-off colors or ones that are similar to ones that we chose for certain seasonal colors or whatever, but that we didn't actually choose. So she has a bunch of those. Um, she has broad nibs on those and italic nibs and stuff like that. So she, she actually likes broad nibs a lot too, as well as italics. Um, so the Premier is definitely one that she has. She actually has, and she would probably be ashamed to know that I say this, but she has a Mont Blanc Bohème that was a gift to her that uh, she actually shamefully likes a lot. So she would never buy that pen for herself, but if she, it's a broad nib too, so she just really likes how wet that is. And it's a smaller pen too, with a retractable nib, kind of safety pen, so it's kind of cool. Um, so she likes that, but it's cartridge only too, and that's kind of annoying. So anyway, that would, those would be some of her favorites um, that she likes. George A on Facebook, there's al there always appears to be some sort of condensation on the metal part of the Pilot Metropolitan converter. Um, even when it's not exposed to drastic changes in weather temperature. Why is that? I don't have a clue what you're talking about there, George. I'll be completely honest. I've got several different Metropolitans. I don't bring them here and there very much. I have one pen that I keep in my laptop bag that is behind the camera. That's why I'm pointing there. Um, that I carry with me and, you know, I guess I only fill it when I'm in my office here usually. Um, I've never noticed any condensation like what you're describing. So I would have to say it's probably something due to your climate. Um, unless you've got some kind of ink leak in there that looks like condensation, but I feel like you would know that if that was the case. Um, but yeah, I would say this is probably something with your climate maybe um, that would be doing that. Otherwise, I am completely baffled. I don't have a clue. So kind of the reason I wanted to include this question is because I don't have a clue what you're talking about because I have not seen it happen myself. And I really haven't heard of that happening a lot. So I'm soliciting for anyone who's listening to this to comment in the comments on YouTube or on the blog to say whether this has been an issue for you too, if you've noticed that, because it's a very curious thing for me. Steve K on Facebook, why do certain inks work better in some fountain pens? Specifically, I bought a Pilot Falcon SEF and tried it out with some Lamy Turquoise and it railroaded like crazy. I was ready to return the pen when I decided to clean it and ink it up with Liberty Silesium, and now I couldn't be happier. The pen works like a charm, great flex and no railroading. Any insights into this phenomenon? Is it just a trial and error kind of thing? 
Well, first off, Liberty's Elysium is awesome. So that right there, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's gonna write a little bit wetter than Lamy Turquoise. That's part of it. Lamy Turquoise is usually a pretty decent kind of all around ink. Um, but yeah, okay, so we, in general, I'll start at the 50,000 foot view. When you're using pens, different, you got all these factors. You got ink, you got pens, paper, your own handwriting, your style, your writing speed, angle, pressure, all those kind of things. A lot of different factors there. They all play into each other. It makes for a really personal writing experience because you write with one pen very differently than somebody else does with theirs. So you get to play around and find kind of like this exact ideal experience that you like to have. The maddening part about that though is it is inconsistent because literally Rachel can take one pen with ink, same ink pen paper, and it looks and performs very differently on the page than it does when I hold it just because of all the factors that are different from one person writing to another. So <coughs> there's that aspect of things. But when you get into, sorry, that sounded gross, I just realized. Um, so when you get into pens and how different pens and inks interact with each other, yes, absolutely, they interact differently with each other. You know, the, the feed that's on one pen could be different on another pen and how the viscosity of the ink and the flow and lubrication that it has in it can act differently on one or the other, and the nib size makes a difference too. And then when you start throwing soft nibs in there, which is what you're dealing, the soft extra fine Falcon, that just that just throws a wrench into everything even more. That's just another, you're getting to exponential factors here that are that are varying the writing experience. So it's I can speak in generalities and say some inks may perform better in some ways for some people than others. Honestly though, there are so many factors involved. The best thing I can say is like what you said at the end, is it a trial and error kind of thing? Yeah, kind of sometimes. You know, that's one of the first things we do when we're troubleshooting something, especially like a soft texture fine Falcon. If somebody says, this thing is railroading like crazy, we say like, okay, well we wanna make sure that the pen's working properly. The first thing we say almost is gonna be like, clean the pen and try a different ink. See if you have a different experience. Cause I can't tell you how many times we hear exactly this kind of thing. And this is the reason why we carry 560 different kinds of ink. It's like, why do you need 50 black inks? Because that's about how many we have, is 50. Why do you need 50 different black inks? Well, some black inks don't flow the same as others. Some have a little more shading than others. Some are more permanent than others. It's a lot of different factors, but it's like, you know, a pile of soft extra fine. Noodler's Black could perform great in it for me, but not for you. You could try Heart of Darkness and it's great for you and not for me. So you gotta experiment a little bit. That's why we do the swab shop. That's why we have ink samples because the ink samples, it's like sometimes you just need to try 10 different inks to find that perfect one, you know, even within a given shade of ink before you find something that really kind of works out well for you. So yep, that would be it. There's just so many different factors, but you gotta hang in there, especially on these flex, these soft nib pens you got to try them out a little bit. And that's one thing that's hard is, you know, some people see other people that are using them and think like, oh, I should be able to pick the pen up and use it just like that. Mm, it's usually not that ca not the case there. Even me personally, like honestly, I was going to shoot a video on the Pilot Custom 912. I did the Nibdook writing sample, you know, using all the five nibs that we have. That darn Falcon, that FA nib, it's not the same as the nib on the Pilot Falcon, which is a little confusing, but the FA nib on that thing, I was getting railroading and stuff a lot more than I felt that I should have. So I was trying to figure out, this is a writing sample I have of it, and I was getting railroading and hard starts and stuff, and I was trying to figure out what is going on. So I haven't shot a video on that yet because there's a lot that I have to learn even five years in on how to use this particular nib because it's just a very different nib than anything I've ever used. And I'm learning that with that particular pen, you gotta hold it at a steeper angle, way lighten up on the, the writing pressure to get that thing to perform really well. It can flex really nice. It's an extremely soft nib, it's way softer than the Falcon. But you get flow issues if you got a heavy hand and you hold the pen low, you know, which that's my natural like go-to. And same thing with Drew. Drew is like kind of my partner in crime with experimenting with a lot of pens. But I'm learning even that him and I have kind of a similar hand as opposed to like we had Rachel try it out. She didn't have a problem writing with that pen at all. You know, so it's like that's where it can be kind of frustrating sometimes. When you get into these soft nibs and whatnot, it can be a lot of various factors like that. And you may have to really drastically change your own writing style for it to work. Sometimes that doesn't work and you're like, you know what, I just can't handle this pen. That's fine. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the pen though. 
It could just mean that the pen's not right for you. So it might be for me that this 912 FA is just not right for me, but I just want to experiment more to make sure that the pen works well as it should. What I'm finding is that yes, that pen is working as it should. I'm just having to really adjust my style. I, you know, sometimes I can't pick up a pen and in 30 minutes write with it perfectly. I gotta play with it a little bit. I haven't had the time to do that, so that's why you don't have a video on that one yet. But that's a good example there. However, if you look at the Nibnook writing sample for that pen, it looks freaking amazing, right? And we've been selling the pen and you know, people are having good luck with them. It's just certain people like me who write with that style, it's gonna be a little tougher. So you have to experiment and trial and error look crazy. Vlad P on Facebook, hi, hi. Uh, why are gold nibs softer to write with than steel nibs if in the final steps of making any type of nib, a small ball of iridium is added to the tip? In the end, doesn't it all come down to how well that iridium tip is polished? Uh, in a way, yes. So that is a part that's actually touching the paper. You know, that's sort of like when you're driving a car, it's your tires that are actually touching the road. So when it comes to like safety and stuff like that, you know, the tires that are on the road, that makes a big difference. However, there's other factors too. You know, the biggest, the biggest factor that has to do between gold and steel, it doesn't necessarily have to do with the smoothness, the actual smoothness of the ball tip in contact with the paper. Yes, that definitely is a huge factor and that's what you're referring to here. How much that's smoothed out uh, makes a difference there. However, that's not the only factor um, when you're talking about smoothness. Smoothness also is a factor in the softness of the nib, and that's where it can really make a difference for a lot of people. Um, and it's kind of one of these finer points, like you hand somebody a pen with a gold nib, if they've never used a fountain pen before, they're not gonna know the difference between that and a steel nib, generally speaking, or they won't appreciate it for sure. Um, it's kind of something that as you use fountain pens and you get a more kind of discriminating taste, you can really start to tell. It's like anything, you know, it's like if you golf, you know, you could, I could use the same clubs that Tiger Woods uses. I'm not gonna hit like Tiger Woods and I'm not gonna feel the difference because I don't know what the heck I'm doing because I'm not a golfer, you know what I mean? Give me the cheapest, crappiest clubs you have because I'm gonna slice it into the woods anyway, you know? <laughs> I don't want better clubs because I'm just gonna slice it that much further into the, you know, <laughs> and lose that many more balls. Uh, anyway, so it's the it's, it's same thing with wine. If you're tasting wine, I can't tell you the difference between a $5 and a $5,000 bottle of wine. There's no difference to me. There may not actually be a difference sometime. Well, okay, there usually is a difference between that extreme, but um, for, you know, for me, I don't have a discriminating palate, so I can't tell the difference. So for most people, yeah, don't go out and buy a gold nib, even though people are talking how great it is, because those are people that, you know, generally speaking, probably maybe can tell the difference, whereas if you're new into it, you can't, so don't spend the money on it, you know? Um, but uh, you're talking like, what's the actual difference? The actual difference is in the softness of the metal. So stainless steel is a harder metal than gold. Um, and the higher the carat the gold, the softer the metal. Um, now, of course, you can have the thickness of the nib and the way that it's ground and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of engineering, actually, that goes into nib design that can affect how it writes. You know, otherwise, how do you have a pen like Noodler's with a stainless steel flexible nib? You know, it's because of the way that it's ground and cut and all those kinds of things. But nib for nib, if you have the exact same specifications and the only difference is one is stainless steel and one is gold, the gold one is going to have more flexibility to it. It's going to spring more as you're riding with it. So it's gonna act like a shock absorber, like your car when it's driving down the road. As you're driving over bumps and stuff like that, if you have shocks on your car, you're gonna feel fewer of those bumps. Even though the actual road could be the same, you know, the tires, you know, that would be the tip of the nib, would be the same, the shock absorber is going to give it a different feel on the road than it would if you had no shocks on your car, right? And the stainless steel nib is like the no shocks on your car. You're gonna feel everything. And now granted, you're writing on paper, so you're not talking about huge potholes and stuff like that, um, but you're talking, you know, paper definitely has a texture to it. So you're gonna feel toothiness on paper, more on stainless steel, because you're gonna feel more of that kind of feedback than you would with a gold nib. And then your own writing pressure, as you're writing, you know, you're not a robot. You're not holding your hand perfectly level to the paper as you're writing. You know, your hand is gonna vary in the up and down and all that kind of stuff. So you're gonna feel more, uh, it's gonna even out some of the, the, the bumps that you might feel. Not really bumps, but it's gonna even out some of the unevenness that you have in your own writing style on a gold nib as opposed to a steel. That's what's actually happening. 
But also, generally speaking, when you have a gold nib, they're more expensive. Nib manufacturers tend to spend a little more time smoothing, polishing, aligning, and so on on those more expensive nibs. You know, for the sake of stainless steel keeping the cost down, they tend to do more machine work, which maybe isn't getting that same level of detail. So that it also could be a factor that, you know, it's not usually one for one the amount of time that's spent on stainless steel nibs as opposed to gold nibs. So that, that's a big factor as well. All right, I'm doing pretty good on this. Getting a lot of questions out. Number 18, Alan V on Facebook. At present, the name Esterbrook is synonymous with vintage pens. However, the brand is relaunching as a new company making new pens. Have you seen any of the new pens in his Esterbrook possibly headed to GouletPens.com? Well, uh, okay, so you know we don't do anything with vintage pens really. It's um, you know we're all modern here. Esther Brook is an interesting situation. Same kind of thing happened with Conklin. Conklin was a brand from way back in the day. Was recently re revived by Yaffa. Um, Esther Brook. I really don't know anything about the company that did it, and. <laughs> I, I don't have it in the works right now to get Esterbrook. If you are knocking down my doors to carry it, you know, obviously I'll consider it. Um, I want to test it out myself, make sure it's legit. Um, some of the feedback I've seen so far from some of the hardcore Esterbrook fans has not been overwhelmingly positive just based on kind of the design they've chosen to go with and some of the various aspects. Um, that saying, I have not spent a lot of time researching it, so I, I'm not going to try to come to any conclusion really about the new in Esterbrook right now. Um, but I will say, you know, Google it, just check it out. There's some interesting conversations going on there about it. Um, but, you know, if you start knocking down my door enough, I'll get some pens, I'll try it out. If I like them, I'll carry them. That's basically, you know, I don't have anything against Esterbrook. Sure, I would certainly look into them. I am kind of picky about which brands I'll want to choose, so I got to have certain vendor relationships. There has to be an alignment of values about the way that they view fountain pens and their products and stuff like that. Um, so I got to make sure that that stuff lines up. The distribution chain has to be good. The prices have to be right. It has to be economical. It has to be demand for it and all those things. All that comes into play when carrying a new brand. Um, so, you know, we've been so busy with the website and all these other things we've been launching, I have not pursued Esterbrook yet. All right, Gusta M on Facebook. Forgive me if I say your name wrong. Um, I've heard people discussing if you should post the Edison Nouveau Premier or not. Some say the cap will scratch the body of the pen. What do you think? Um, it's certainly a potential, you know, it's a solid acrylic pen. Any solid acrylic pen that you're posting at all, there's always that potential, you know, especially if you're posting and like twisting or anything like that, you know, the threads on the cap could theoretically scratch the pen. You know, that is absolutely possible. You know, however, just in normal use, you're going to get that pen scratched. Like I can just tell you that right now. If you're using this pen, it's going to get fine scratches. You know, it's an acrylic material. It's a, it's a, it's a very durable material in the grand scheme of things. Um, but it's very hard. It can it can scratch easier than you know some materials would. I guess um, it's not treated in any special way to resist scratching or, or anything like that. So it's it's a possibility. Um, it's not a defect on the pen if that does happen. Um, so th the situation you're in, if you know. If, if you are really worried about that, just don't post it. That pen in particular is long enough where it's not really a pro Even for me, I've got really big hands. I'm actually just realizing I have a Premier right here, um, the new winter one. So, um, you know, if you're using that particular pen, I've got really big hands, and I've still got plenty here to post. It, that's actually pretty long when it's posted. And it's a very light pen, too, so it does not throw the balance off, really, when you're, you're posting it versus not. So you're totally cool not posting it. Uh, me, personally, I post it. I'm not, not worried about it. The nice thing about an acrylic pen like this, if you do get any fine scratches on it, you can polish it off pretty easily, you know, especially if it's not really deep. If it's just some light wear and tear like that, even just like throwing it on a desk like that, over time, you're going to get all these little fine kind of things on there. You can always polish it back up. You can use like an acrylic polishing compound, which not everybody has like laying around their desk or whatever. Another handy thing to have around is a jeweler's cloth. Those are handy. You can get that at any jewelry store. Um, but it's a, a cloth with a polishing compound kind of in, impregnated into it. Um, and you can rub out really fine scratches on pens like this with that. It also polishes up metal really nicely, so it cleans off nibs and clips. Clips tend to take a good bit of abuse as well because they're always out there. Nibs, maybe not, not so much, but the clips from just like being, you know, banged around will be in kind of that situation. So that's, uh, that's definitely a recommendation I would have. I would say, you know, Choose how paranoid you want to be. I realize it's not an it's not an inexpensive pen, so you want to take care of it, but it's not the end of the world if that does happen. 
All right, number 20 on Facebook. Forgive me, your name is in characters and I cannot read it. Is the writing sample for the preppy in the nibnook done with the eyedropperized or converter pen? Um, it was with a converter, so uh, I don't think this is the exact pen that I used, but I, you know, I had used a converter on it, so that's kind of the situation. So what I do when I nibnook, I, uh, I always use a converter. I never eyedropper anything for the nibnook, unless it's a pen that can only be used with an eyedropper, and I'm trying to think of what pen that that is the situation, and I actually can't think of one that's only eyedropper um, off the top of my head. So what I do is I ink it up. And then what I do is I take a paper towel to it and like try to suck out a good portion of the ink just to make sure that I'm not getting how wet that pen is writing on its initial flow, right? Because when you first ink up a pen, the feed is all filled with ink, the nib is all wet and everything, and it's gonna write wetter than it will eventually once that kind of runs out. So I'll take a paper towel and I'll suck out like a good portion of ink until I can like visibly see that the ink levels drop through the converter because then I know what's coming through that pen is naturally what's flowing. Then I write with the pen a good bit on a separate sheet of paper, and then once I've got a good feel for it and kind of understand what the pen's all about, then I go in and do my, my writing sample for that particular nib size for the nib nook. So I, you know, it's not, it's never going to be a truly standardized process because I'm a human being, I'm doing the writing samples. I am consistently doing it, but even my writing style may have changed, you know, over, I guess, I guess it was about three years ago I started the nib nook. Wow. Yeah. So my writing style may have changed even a little bit, but I'm still the same person, so there's some that's the most consistency I think that I can provide, unless I do the entire nibnook over again every year or whatever. That's not practical, but you know that's what I would say is that I try to eliminate as many variables as I can when I do the nibnook. Um, I don't know that it would particularly matter whether it's eyedropper or converter filled or not, but that's what I do. So a little insight there. Allison S. on Facebook, do you think my Nemesis Base State Blue will stain my new neon yellow Lamy Safari pen? Uh, I mean, that ink will pretty much cling to whatever you put it on, so I won't say that it can't stain that pen. Um, that ink, you know, people talk about how much it stains, but bleach cuts through it really well. So if you do get that ink on anything, um, you know, bleach will clean it up really well. If you use like a 10% bleach solution in water, um, that will pretty safely cut through the ink without ha causing harm. What you don't want to do is use straight bleach on any of your stainless steel components on your pens or really any metal components because bleach is corrosive to steel. So you want to make sure that you're not like soaking your pen in solid bleach. That would not be good for it, you know, but uh, using a diluted bleach solution just to flush through the pen, especially with a pen like Lamy, if you can take the nib off, that would be even better. Um, if you need to clean ink off the nib, you could always use a little Q-tip with the bleach and just kind of rub it off and then just wash it off immediately. That's not going to cause, uh, you know, long-term harm. It's, it's prolonged exposure that's going to cause you issues soaking it that would be your problem, especially if it's not a diluted, diluted bleach solution. Even household bleach is pretty diluted. It's like 5% bleach. You know, uh, <laughs> I used to power wash houses with my dad and we would use industrial bleach. Uh, that stuff is really nasty. I mean, that stuff, you get that on your finger and it starts to burn your skin off in about 10 seconds, you know, and it, you, you can literally feel like a slime on your thumb for the rest of the day. And it like it almost like burns your fingerprints off, you know that that stuff, you know, and, and that's really concentrated in an industrial situation. Like when you're power washing a house, you know, you might use a half gallon of that stuff on an entire house, you know, but in a pen, you don't need anything that strong, you know. Um, so that is what I would say. I don't know anything in particular, like the. I don't think you have to be particularly worried about that pen, that ink, whatever, you know, just. If, if you're that concerned about it, just don't do it. You know what I mean? Especially if it's your nemesis, you know? Why are you wanting to use your nemesis so bad? I get, you, I, get, I get the joke though. Okay, Michelle W on Facebook, what are the components of the Platinum Preppy Eyedropper Conversion Kit? Does it contain the both the O-rings and silicone grease or must the silicone be purchased separately? Okay, so we actually recently cleaned up the verbiage. Long story short, okay, the reason we started doing this Preppy Eyedropper Conversion Kit is because 
It was already being done by Swisher pens when we came on the scene. Swisher had been around for 10, 15 years when we came onto the scene, and they've been doing this preppy eyedropper conversion thing for years. So we also wanted to offer it. You know, I usually don't copy what competitors are doing, and I don't care that much. In the earlier stages, it was something that we came on and everybody was asking us like, hey, can you do a conversion for me? That's why we started doing it. Um, but I was aware of it because of what Swisher was doing and it was fairly commonly known what the eyedropper conversion was. Um, so we didn't have the most explicit verbiage about it. Recently, we've had more new people coming in. Swisher's been out of business for several years now and I don't even know if anybody else is doing a preppy eyedropper conversion. I honestly don't. We've been doing them for five years, and it's just kind of like something that, honestly, we haven't even really thought about that much because we just, we've been doing it for so long, we thought it was kind of common known. So we have recently gone on the site and improved some of the verbiage about what it actually means. So I actually just talked about the eyedropper thing a second ago with the Nibda question. Um, but uh, so there's a couple different ways you can use this pen. You can use a cartridge. You can use a converter, like I have in here, that you can just fill from a bottle. Or you can convert this thing to an eyedropper, which means filling the whole body with ink. You don't use a cartridge or a converter. It's a great thing for this pen because it's an inexpensive pen. You do an eyedropper conversion. You don't have to buy a converter, which the converter costs twice as much as the pen. So that's kind of neat being able to do that. So as a service, we offer, if you want to, we will convert it for you and send it to you. So what it is, is we put an O-ring on here and we put silicone grease on the threads. The thing's good to go. Silicone will last for a while, not forever though. Um, and you need, to, it does not include a tub of silicone because the little tub of silicone that we have, if I even have one on me, ah, I don't think I have one within arm's reach, um, but it's a little tub of silicone that we sell for $2.50. The preppy eyedropper conversion is $2. So we do not include like all of the stuff to do your own conversion with the preppy eyedropper conversion. That's not what it is. It's we are converting it for you. So when you get the pen, you ink it up, you're good to go. Technically, you don't need both an O-ring and silicone grease in order to do that. You really only need one, but we use both as a fail-safe. And I always, you kind of tell people it's good to have a fail-safe, especially when you have this much ink in a pen. It's never a bad idea to try to leak-proof it as much as you can. Um, so if you buy a set of four preppy O-rings, it costs you a dollar. If you buy a tub of silicone grease, it costs you $2.50. So that's $3.50. Technically, you can convert four preppies with that, with those O-rings. We charge $2 for a preppy eyedropper conversion to do it ourselves. If you're thinking about it purely as the supplies that I can buy for what I'm getting with an eyedropper conversion, yes, it seems very expensive for what we are doing. However, there's labor involved. There's time involved. We have to stop everything that we're doing when we're pulling orders, have our pullers go through and, and go in here and do this grease and the whole thing. That's time. So you're paying for our time to do that conversion for you. So for some people, it is a terrible value and I would never try to sell that service to anybody. I really haven't even talked about that service much at all. In fact, I show a video where I show you how to do your own eyedropper conversion. I would much rather you do it yourself. Get the O-rings, get the silicone grease, do it yourself. Um, it's a much better economical thing. However, some people don't want to deal with that, so we offer it as a service, and that's what it's all about. Uh, let's see here, that was number 23. All right, no, that was number 22. All right, 23, uh, Miley Z on Facebook. With your ink sample stock down post ink sample palooza, this seems like a good time to ask, how do you fill the ink samples? I have visions of a table full of sample vials and auto pipettes. Am I right? Uh, no, we don't have any auto pipettes. We do it by hand uh, because we kind of have to. I mean, if we, were, if we were bottling up one color uh, from a large container, into these samples, it would probably make sense to have some kind of like auto mechanized thing. And trust me, I've looked into that stuff. Super expensive. Holy cow, that stuff gets expensive. Um, but that would make more sense. Like say we were an ink manufacturer, we had seven colors of ink and we sold thousands and thousands of bottles at a time. 
yeah, it makes sense to have an autofill thing, you know, and automate the process, you know. It's really cool, actually, you know, if you start getting into, um, you know, automated equipment and stuff, I, I personally am just kind of fascinated. I love watching how it's made and ultimate factories and those kind of things and just seeing the custom equipment they have to bottle up Coca-Cola or whatever, you know, it's fascinating to me. Um, it is not that elaborate of a process around here, all right? Not only are we not big enough into production like that, but we're, we're sampling up like maybe a bottle at a time or two bottles if it's crazy or like if we're doing ink drop we'll sample up like bottle after bottle after bottle but it's still small containers and it's still you know that we're filling from so we can't really do like large batch automated kind of equipment so it is manual and that is all I'm going to say because the rest of the process is very proprietary. Okay, so I got through 23 questions. I had two more and I just got the battery warning that my battery is about to die. I need to get a new I need to get a new battery situation. I've talked about that like pretty much every week, but that is kind of my cue to wrap things up. So I don't know if 23 is my record, but I think I did pretty okay, especially with my coughing fit earlier in there, and I'm sorry about that. Um, so hopefully this kind of makes up for some lost time, covered a lot of things, maybe not as much in depth with as many tangents as possible, but uh, try to cover it as much as well as I could. So thank you to everybody who's been patient with me. Thank you for if you've been patient with the website, patient through the holidays. Trust me, really, really appreciate it. And we are working our tails off to try to take care of that stuff for you as much as possible. Hope you enjoyed this Q&A. I am planning to be back next week. It'll be the last one before Christmas. Technically, it'll be the last one of 2014 because the one after that will be the day after Christmas. And I'm just going to call it right now. I ain't doing a Q&A during that one. So next week will be the last one of 2014. Crazy, number 60. So that'll be kind of cool. Um, so you can post comments. If you got any questions, you know, YouTube, Twitter, you know, um, a post on Facebook. That's where a lot of my questions end up coming through is Facebook. So just check on Facebook, really. I'll just kind of point everybody there, do that. But I uh, really enjoy doing the Q&A. It's good to be back. Happy to be doing it. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Hope great rest of the week. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. You can get this video and more like it. So that would be awesome. Check out goodlaypens.com. Go pick up any last minute stuff for the holidays. Be happy to help you out. Hope you have a great week. And as always, right on.